Hi, everyone, and welcome back to episode one of Experimenting with Existence, a series where I take a closer look at some of the interests I have that are non-philosophy related. And in this episode, episode one, we've been discussing in great detail one of my favorite hobbies or things to do, and that's strategy board games. And in this part, part seven, we're going to discuss uh, something that happened back in 2013 when I, namely, my interactions with a publisher who expressed interest in some of my designs. Uh, unlike the first six parts of this episode, which were rather lengthy to say the least, these last two parts, part seven and part eight, are probably going to be fairly short, relatively speaking. They won't have sections or subsections or anything like that. And in view of that, I'm going to go ahead and just dive right in here and start discussing, uh, again, my interaction with the publisher back in 2013. The first thing I would say, uh, as was the case in part six when I discussed entering that Rio Grande Games Design Contest in Milwaukee back in 2010, the same thing applies here, and that's that I want to throw out the disclaimer that we're dealing with things that happened over a decade ago. And if you know me, I have a terrible memory to begin with, and we're going off my mem memory here. So I just want to, again, offer that this disclaimer at the outset. Um, but for the most part, you know, I don't think my memory is too fuzzy on most of these details, or at least the ones that I'm, I'm going to cover. But I did want to acknowledge that, uh, that, again, this happened quite some time ago. Uh, so we're talking again back in 2013. This is a few years down the road from having entered that Rio Grande design uh, competition, where, as I mentioned in part uh, part six of this episode, I ended up getting runner up or coming in second place. Uh, again, the winner of that contest had their game published, Kane Klinko. Uh, kudos to him again. I came in second, so I had, a, as I intimated in the previous part, right when I discussed all this, I had a, a sort of bittersweet. I, it was great to hear positive things and have sort of these this sort of encouraging experience for the most part. But then it was, it's kind of sucked to nevertheless, you know, end up so close but not get it, right? Not get there and not have my game published. And then, as I alluded to in the previous part, right, King Klingo, fast forward, he has several games that are, are published and is a very established designer in his own right. So it's it's kind of like, you know, I always play the what if kind of game, what what would have happened if only I had done just a little bit better. Uh, but anyway, so having gained sort of some, some confidence nonetheless from that experience, you know, we're moving then two years, three years down the road here to 2013. And my, again, my interactions with this publisher who expressed some interest in some of my designs. What I remember is initially, I oddly enough, it, it began uh, with communications through LinkedIn. I can't remember who initially started it, whether it was, so Matthew Duhan is the name of the, I wanna say CEO or owner of Gozer Games. And so this is uh, Gozer Games here. This is one of their games that I purchased, uh, ended up owning. Uh, but anyway, so Matthew and I began corresponding through LinkedIn. I can't remember who initiated that or how it started. Uh, but we did begin our communications, I remember, through LinkedIn, and he expressed, you know, that, yes, they were interested in taking a closer look. So at that time, through, as I'll discuss in part eight, uh, my interactions with the UMKC Entrepreneurship Scholars Program, I started a website where I posted, you know, videos and pictures of my games and summaries and so on. So this is how he was able to become familiar with my various designs. And anyway, he then expressed, yes, Gozer Games, Gozer Games is the name of the company, and Gozer Games is interested in, you know, taking a closer look at some of these designs. Specifically, then, he mentioned uh, three in particular. So, you're, again, you're going back to what I had designed up to that point, which was 2013. So, he, he expressed interest in Utopia, number 10, which I haven't actually talked about yet in any of the previous parts of this episode, but these other two I have. Uh, I really, right, this was the subject of uh, the last part of the episode, part six, American Numismatist. That was the game that was entered into the Milwaukee contest. And then Microbruin, I did mention this in part five, where I detailed some of my better, more polished designs. So you're familiar, if you've watched that uh, that part anyway, or that video with Microbruin, you're familiar with, if you watched the previous part, right, part six with American Numismatist. The only new one here is Utopia. Now, I did mention Sophia when going through 
my most polished designs in part five. And I mentioned Sophia now because Sophia, I think, is number 35 or something like that down the road. And it's, it reminds me of Utopia. Utopia, you might think of as like the precursor of Sophia. There's a lot of similarities. They're both kind of civilization builders, if you will. But there are some significant intriguing differences. We're not going to take a super close look at Utopia like we did my more uh, polished designs. Uh, but I will mention sort of some of the things that stand out with respect to Utopia versus Sophia, since, again, they are pretty similar in terms of their overall theme, right? You're building kind of the civilization, but there are some, so they, they really remind me of, of one another, uh, especially in that respect. But there are some significant differences, so I'm going to cover those briefly here. For example, Utopia actually has like a board where, remember in Sophia, there's just cards that you're playing into your tableau. Everybody has their own private tableau. Well, in Utopia, there's actually a board on which you're placing your colored tokens that represent your country, uh, civilization, if you will. And at the beginning of the game, one cool thing about this game is that there can be all sorts of different boards with different layouts and so on. And then these things are randomized. How much prestige each area is worth if you, uh, I don't know the, the price proper term, but if you dominate or control, control is probably the right word, control that ter territory, what the environment offers to, there's different sort of resources that each area is going to offer if you go there and uh, establish some presence. So there's this map element and this board element where you're actually placing troops and your presence, and then you're going to move those around, try to take certain ones over, and that's a significant way to then uh, earn points. And of course, that's not, that was not the case in Sophia. But you'll see then there are some similarities here, right? Remember, there are certain things you could acquire via wealth in Sophia. Well, similarly, you can acquire certain things in a similar fashion here uh, with wealth and then research um, in this game. The other thing that I won't get into too many of the nuances here, but the other thing that kind of sticks out in my mind about this game that I really remember liking is the there's a kind of draft phase where this so there's a ton of different cards and a huge variety there that's similar to Sophia as well where there's different there's different categories and so on and these cards are doing a whole slew of different things for you um, but what happens though is there's whoops um, the way you acquire them is via a draft mechanism so at the beginning of the round you're setting out a certain number of new cards uh, I think it's three times the number of players. And there's a first player, which rotates each round. And begin with the first player, there's that draft phase where you just uh, add another card from the draft, right, the, the cards that were just drawn for that round. You add one of them, you, you draft it, and add it to your deck. And then everybody else does that as well, three times. And then the interesting thing is, right after that, you take all your cards you have in your deck, shuffle them. So the ones you just acquired may show up right away or they may never show up you never know right you're, you're building this deck over time uh with all these unique different sort of cards and then you draw three in the next phase from that deck which you in turn can then finance and you know you you uh, uh earn a certain number of, or amount of money each round and that's you can boost that you know your um your income you can you can boost that through certain cards and so on but uh, via this income you have, then you are uh, financing a certain, whatever number of those cards you drew that you want. And so basically putting them in place. So it's one thing to draw and ac or acquire and draft those cards to begin with in that, that previous round or previous phase of the round. And it's another thing then to get them out and then finance them and put them into play. Right? So that's the uh, other major thing that kind of stood out about this game and kind of sets it apart from Sophia. So while there are many, many parallels uh, between the two games, there are nevertheless some differences. So that was the other game that Mr. Duhon and Gozer Games expressed interest in. So, and in fact, Utopia, so that's the third one. You know, that's actually the one that I remember him offering the most feedback on. In fact, I can't remember him really us having discussions about either of the other two games. It was really, for the most part, Utopia. That's the one they, they got to the table and had feedback on uh, at the point we stopped sort of corresponding, which I'll get to here in a moment. Um, mentioned LinkedIn, mentioned Mr. Duhan, who was my point of contact, if you will. Um, 
I also remember trying to, so, you know, wow, somebody's, you know, a publisher's interested, but it was, you know, so that's a great feeling. But then, you know, who is this company? I hadn't necessarily heard of Gozer Games. So in the process of vetting, you know, this company and making sure everything was on the up and up and legit, I actually contacted one of their, pre, you know, a designer who had published through them. And I think it was Brian Lewis, the designer of this game, and, uh, you know, sort of established, yeah, this is legit. I had a good experience and so on. So I remember, you know, going through that and actually going through that process and emailing, I think it was Brian Lewis. And, you know, as part of my vetting process and just making sure, again, that um, this this was uh, a company I, I might want, want to work with. Um, I also remember, I think, uh, again, this is kind of a, a thing all rookies go through, uh, having at this point done my, you know, a ton of research in terms of, you know, getting into the industry and so on. But this is a common rookie thing that rookies will wrestle with. And that's, you know, giving up your baby, so to speak, right? Sending out uh, this intellectual property that, that's yours, right? These, these games that you've worked hard on with all the rules, you know, exactly how to play, right? It's your top secret recipe, so to speak sending it out without really any clue what's going to happen, right? Without any real safeguards in place um, for the most part. Um, now you can sort of try to seek out when you deal with various publishers, you know, um, what's the right term? I don't remember the, you know, at the moment, the, the proper legal terms, but try to get them to basically agree that they won't disseminate it and so on. Um, but that's from what I gather, having done again, some research into the process, that's kind of flagged as a rookie kind of move. Uh, from the perspective of the publisher. So nevertheless, the whole point in me bringing this up now is that, you know, your first time dealing with the publisher, all these things, and I was no exception, go through your mind. Like, am I really going to send out all the rules, you know, all these components that I, you know, everything that I worked so hard on, really not knowing what's going to come of this situation. And to this day, actually, point of fact, I don't know, you know, what happened to the prototypes that I shipped to Gozer Games, you know, what they've done with it, which presumably is nothing, you know, I'm sure it's, everything is fine, and they're not doing anything untoward or anything like that, but, you know, there's that, you wrestle with, you know, what's going to happen to my baby, or my babies in this case, uh, you know, I was no exception, but you kind of, uh, you realize, I think, over time, as, you know, I did as well, that, again, this is kind of a rookie move, look, what do you really have to lose at that point, right? When you're a rookie and you aren't established anyway, like what's the worst that's going to come? Somebody steals your game and you, if that did actually happen, which I, I don't personally even know of any instance where that happened, I mean, it was your game. Odds are you're going to, you're going to have proof of that. Uh, you can fight the battle and so on. Um, that's the worst case scenario. And look, the other thing is if, if, if the game's any good, the publishers aren't going to want to try to steal it and screw you over. They're going to want to try to establish a good rapport with you, a good relationship with you, because presumably you're a good designer who, you know, uh, they might want to work with not only now, but down the road. So it wouldn't behoove them to screw you over, so to speak, you know, from the, from the outset. Um, but anyway, it's still, I think, so granted of that, those, those points, which I think um, went out, Nevertheless, there is that kind of uh, issue you deal with, especially when you have no reputation, so to speak. You have no connections in the industry, and you're you're getting established from the get-go. Like, what happens if I really do have something here and somebody just steals it? Um, again, I wanted to acknowledge that that does go through your mind, but it didn't really, you know, it wasn't something that uh, concerned me too much anyway. And uh, again, because I had done my fair fair share of research even back then at that point. So I ultimately end up shipping prototypes, and I, I have, uh, I definitely remember the night before. I had, a, I don't remember if he imposed a deadline. I doubt it, or if it was my own self-imposed deadline. But any, anyway, there was a certain date that I wanted to ship these games out by, and I just remember basically staying up the whole night before, getting everything perfect, you know, um, even fine-tuning the rules and and getting all the prototypes just right and folding them up in these, you know, uh, the mailing packages and so on. And, you know, of course, now, fast forward, here's the philosophical side of me. It's like, what was all that effort? Look at all that time and energy and resources. And, you know, where did it get me ultimately? You might say, um, even though, you know, I didn't get a published game out of it, that maybe it was all worth it for different reasons. But it's something I think about, right? Things that we 
invest so much time into and we if we screw something up it's like the end of the, the world at that time but fast forward a decade later and it's like what was i thinking like it's not it wasn't that big of a deal look what what came of it basically nothing anyway um where was i so, so I, I i uh i ended up shipping these prototypes off and um you know it, it everything takes a while and i think it, was, I mean, it wasn't just my specific um dealings with this specific company but that seems to be the case in the industry as a whole right dealing with these publishers they you, you are you know at this stage when they're play testing your game you're like way back down the line they have all sorts of different games and and different stages of publication that they're also worrying about so it's only one sort of branch or aspect of all these different things that they're worried about right um so the whole, whole point being that no surprise right communication takes a long time seemingly forever from the perspective of the designer and you know you're just waiting for each new uh, communication you might receive from the publisher and so this was uh, no exception, you know, I invested a lot of time preparing these packages and these games for for Gozer games and shipping them off. And in the, uh, to, to uh, Mr. Duhon's credit and Gozer games credit, you know, they did end up play testing at least Utopia uh, because they did offer, he did offer fairly extensive feedback. I remember with respect to Utopia, I, I remember, uh, you know, we, we had discussions on it and thinking you know these are one of the, the things that come up where the play testers and the publisher have certain ideas and maybe the designer um doesn't agree right but i kind of remember thinking they had certain suggestions i remember thinking ah, you know i wasn't too um necessarily inclined to endorse them immediately that's the only thing i kind of remember about our discussions that's why i bring it up not that it was a terror what they suggested was terrible or anything like that but these are just the things i remember the highlights from our discussion uh and so again we have these back and forth uh, he mentions how he was getting that to the table and so on. But what ended up happening over time uh, is that the communication became less and less frequent. It would you know, be much longer in between phone calls and emails to the point where eventually I just kind of thought to myself, nothing's going to come of this. And I think what ultimately transpired, I, I never really verified this or substantiated this, but going back to you can go online still to the website that they have for Gozer Games, and it's still up. Um, I checked it earlier today. But if you go there, what you'll notice is that, like, the dates of posts and updates and stuff, it seems to go back to, like, 2012, 2013, which was about the time, again, that I was having this correspondence. So about the time that our correspondence fizzled out, it seems like the company as a whole and the website and so on well, the website's still there, right? But the company as a whole sort of fizzled out as well. So I don't know if that was the reason why ultimately our discussions came to a close. Um, you know, it makes sense if the, the publisher is no more that, you know, individual discussions with particular designers are going to come to a close as well. I don't know if that was the case, but if you go again, you go to the website, you'll notice that it seems like that might be the case. Um, but for whatever reason, things just kind of fizzled out. And while I had a lot of enthusiasm and was super psyched at the beginning just over time right even when we were having our correspondence it was just there was so much time in between that it just you know you you sort of start to lose interest you know the more time it takes until the point where you realize man i'm i'm really not even corresponding with them at, anymore at all um so it is what it is it reminded me a lot of so sort of kind of thinking back on the experience as a whole um it reminds me more or less of my experience with entering the Rio Grande design competition in 2010, which was the subject of part six. It reminds me a lot of that in the sense that there was a lot of good that I took away from it, but then it was also kind of bittersweet, right? There was kind of a, a, a sense of disappointment ultimately in the end, because like it or not, despite all my hard, hard work and all my effort and all that time I put in, lost sleep, as I alluded to earlier, um, despite all of that, you know, nothing ends up coming to fruition. Now, who, who knows? Maybe because of all, all these steps I've had to take and these trials and tribulations, right? Maybe my work and my designs in the process have become better and better somehow as a result of that. Who knows? But it's still certainly, it was reminiscent, I think, um, of the con design contest in 2010 in the sense that 
it was encouraging, but at the same time, a bit of a disappointment to not ultimately get a game published. So, uh, and, you know, previewing then part eight, where I'll discuss my experience in the UMKC Entrepreneurship Scholars Program, I had the same sort of, ultimately the same sort of feelings result from that experience, right? A sense of uh, a lot of good, right? There were a lot of um, positive things to be gleaned from the experience, but as I'll discuss in the next part, it, nothing ultimately ended up coming from it, right? I still, while the aim was to ultimately get my games out there, um, to publish my games through that program, the idea was, as we'll see, to publish them independently, right? If I couldn't get them or for whatever reason didn't want to publish them through a major publisher, right? What, you know, the, th that was going to be the process then. And that was sort of what that program was geared towards was helping me go that route. But ultimately, again, the point here is um, I had the same sort of feelings in the end, right? Where there was a lot of positive the positives that came from it, from the experience, from the program, uh, from doing all the things that I did as a part of the program, but ultimately in the end, right, a kind of sense of disappointment because ultimately there's no game published, right, whether it's through a major publisher or independently, right, through uh, my own avenues. It is what it is, though, and man, this thing, I'm, I'm ending on such a downer. I, I make it sound like, especially these last two parts, uh, you know, oh, there's this sense of disappointment, but you know, it's never easy. I think uh, there's all, for every successful designer out there, you probably have several that aren't successful. And for those that who, who are successful, there were probably, you know, many, many failed attempts, or at least for, for many of them. So it is what it is. It's part of the process. Um, you know, ultimately I'll revisit the, my attempts to get something published, but uh, you know, I don't mean to make it out and end on such a sour note because again, there was a lot of positives to be gleaned from interacting with this publisher and you know, taking part of, in the UMKC Entrepreneurship Scholars Program. So having said that, let's go ahead then and move on to the final part of episode one here, part eight, where we'll discuss my experience again in that program.